Welcome back to the deep dive. Today, uh, we're tackling something absolutely critical, the diesel generator. Think hospitals, data centers. These are the machines that keep things running when everything else goes dark. They absolutely are. But here's the kicker. The Well, the alarming thing we found in the source is something like 40% of generator failures, they happen right when you need them most, during an emergency. 40%, that's, mm. that's staggering and incredibly frustrating when the stakes are so high. It is, it really points to a failure of uh, proactive thinking, not usually a sudden unpredictable fault. Right, so our goal here is to cut through that. We've dug into the material, pulled out the most common problems, and we wanna give you the practical, actionable fixes. Make sure you're prepared, not you know scrambling in the dark. And the key vulnerability, the place you have to focus, it's the fuel. Over 90%, think about that, 9-0 of diesel engine failures traced back to fuel issues. Wow, 90%. And these problems, they don't just pop up overnight. They often develop silently over months while the generator just sits there waiting. That percentage alone tells you where the maintenance focus really needs to be. It's not just general checks. It's hyper-focused on that fuel system mm. because the cost of failure, well, it dwarfs the cost of doing this right. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's start with the most immediate, the most frustrating failure. Yeah. You hit start and nothing. The generator won't kick over. Okay. So besides the obvious, like an empty tank, which hopefully isn't the case, what are the hidden culprits here? What did the sources point to? Well, it nearly always comes back to fuel quality or delivery. Clog filters are common. Uh, air getting into the fuel lines is another big one. Air infiltration, how does that happen? It could be a loose fitting somewhere, maybe a seal that's just old and degraded. Even a tiny leak lets air in, creates pockets, and the fuel pump just can't build the pressure needed for ignition. And the fuel itself. Huh. It's not just sitting there inertly, is it? It's actually changing over time. Exactly. Diesel isn't stable forever. After just six, maybe 12 months in storage, it starts to break down. It forms these gums, varnishes, basically gunk that clogs everything up. Aww. Filters, injectors, the works. Okay, so degradation is one thing, but then there's this other threat you mentioned, the diesel bug. Ah, uh, yes. Microbial growth. It sounds nasty, and it is. Why is it such a problem for standby units specifically? Because the conditions are often perfect. Water gets in the tank, maybe condensation from humid air, maybe a tiny leak somewhere. That water creates an environment where... Uh, bacteria and fungi can thrive. Right, at the bottom of the tank where the water settles? Precisely. They live in that fuel-water interface, creating this thick, slimy sludge. If that sludge gets sucked into the fuel lines, game over. Total blockage. Plus, their waste products are acidic, which corrodes metal parts, tanks, lines, injectors. Okay, if 90% of failures start with fuel, we need the best defense. What's the strategy? It has to be structured. Mm. Number one, check your fuel level and quality. Do it monthly. If that fuel is going to sit for more than six months, use a stabilizer. And if it's older than a year? Replace it. Don't risk it. The cost of new fuel is tiny compared to a failure. Then, manage the tank itself. Keep it as full as you reasonably can. Less airspace means less room for humid air to condense into water. Simple physics. Exactly. Less air, less water. And for the air that does get in, install tank vents with desiccant filters. These are crucial. Desiccant. Like those little packets you find in packaging? Sort of, yeah. But industrial grade, yeah. they actively pull moisture out of the air entering the tank. Keeps the air inside dry, preventing condensation in the first place. Got it. And there's this other point, a sort of low-tech backup I really like. Oh, the dipstick, yes. <laughs> Don't just trust the electronic fuel gauge on the panel. <laughs> well, those sensors can fail. They corrode. They get gummed up. They might tell you the tank is half full when it's nearly empty. So every month, physically dip the tank. Verify the gauge reading. It's simple, but it catches failures the electronics might miss. A good old-fashioned reality check. Love it. Okay, so we've covered starting failures, mostly fuel-related. But what if the generator does start, but then dies mid-operation? The sources mention something called wet stacking. Ah, wet stacking. Yes, this is a big one for generators that don't work hard enough. It's counterintuitive, right? You think running it lightly is good for it. But it's not. Why? Because if you run a diesel generator at less than, say, 30% of its rated load for too long, the engine doesn't get hot enough. Not hot enough for complete combustion. Precisely. It's like trying to burn damp firewood. You get smoke, soot, unburned fuel. This gunk builds up in the exhaust system. Cylinders, turbocharger, exhaust pipes. And the signs. What should you look for? It's pretty unpleasant. You might see thick, black, oily liquid actually dripping from the exhaust connections. 
maybe whiter blue smoke instead of the usual black puff on startup and definitely reduce power output. So the engine needs a proper workout to stay clean. What's the fix? Load bank testing. Monthly. This is non-negotiable, according to the sources. Explain load banking again. It's like a dummy load. Essentially, yes. It's a device, often like a big resistive heater, that connects to the generator's output. It forces the generator to produce significant power, maybe 50% or more of its rating, but that power just gets turned into heat by the load bank. It doesn't go into your building's sensitive systems. So it simulates a real workload safely. And the source has mentioned a minimum runtime. Yeah, at least 30 minutes under that substantial load. That's typically long enough to get the engine and exhaust system really hot, burning off all those deposits, the wet stacking. It cleans everything out. Okay, load bank monthly. Anything else for operational reliability? Regular maintenance is key here too. Change those fuel filters quarterly. Don't wait for them to clog and inspect the fuel tank itself annually, maybe even get it professionally cleaned if needed. Right. Let's shift to what you call the silent killers, things that fail without much warning. Problem three, battery failures. Why are standby batteries so prone to letting you down? Well, they live a tough life, paradoxically, through inactivity. They sit idle for long stretches, then suddenly face this massive demand cranking a big diesel engine. The biggest enemy during that idle time is sulf sulfation. Sulfation, that's buildup on the battery plates. Exactly. Lead sulfate crystals form on the plates. It's a normal part of discharge, but if the battery sits partially discharged or just isn't maintained properly, those crystals harden and grow. They effectively insulate the plates, reducing the surface area that can deliver power. Less surface area means less cranking power when you need it most. Precisely. And battery life is hugely impacted by temperature. In a nice climate-controlled room, a lead-acid standby battery might last, you know, three to five years. But if it's out in a shed, baking in the summer heat or freezing in winter. That lifespan can plummet. Maybe only 18 months, maybe 24 months. Heat is a major killer of lead-acid batteries. You absolutely have to plan for proactive replacement, especially in harsh environments. So waiting until year three could be way too late. What's the routine check? Vigilance. Monthly checks are key. Clean the terminals. Simple baking soda and water paste works wonders to neutralize any corrosion. Then, check the voltage. What's the magic number for voltage? For a standard 12-volt system, you need to see 12.6 volts or slightly higher when it's at rest. That indicates a full charge. Anything less, especially consistently, warrants investigation or replacement. Don't wait for the battery case to swell or leak. Replace it based on age and condition, proactively. Okay, batteries covered. Now, problem four, cooling system failures. The sources flagged these as potentially the most expensive failures. Why is that? Because when a diesel engine overheats badly, it's not usually just one part that fails. The heat causes cascading damage. Like what? Warp cylinder heads are common. That means the head no longer seals properly against the engine block, leading to blown head gaskets. You can get coolant leaking into the cylinders, oil into the coolant. It's a mess. Extreme overheating can even cause pistons to seize in the cylinders. Which basically means a complete engine rebuild. Huge cost. Exactly. A relatively simple cooling system issue, if ignored, can lead to catastrophic six-figure engine damage. So what causes these cooling failures typically? Often, it's simple stuff. Low coolant level is a big one, usually due to leaks, hoses, radiator, water pump seals, sometimes internal leaks, like from that blown head gasket we mentioned. And blockages. Yes. Blocked radiator cores are very common, especially on unit-sided outdoors. Dirt, dust, leaves, insects, uh, cottonwood fluff, it all gets sucked in and clogs the radiator fins, preventing air from flowing through and cooling the liquid inside. Failed components like thermostats sticking shut or water pump failures also happen. Okay, the sources were really specific about how to clean those radiator cores. Right. What was the key instruction? This is critical. When cleaning, usually with compressed air or sometimes a pressure washer on low setting, you must clean from the engine side outwards from the back blowing towards the front. Why is that direction so important? But because if you blow from the front where the debris usually collects, you're just driving that dirt and debris deeper into the radiator fins. You compact it against the core. Making the blockage worse. Exactly. By blowing from the engine side outwards, you're pushing the debris out the way it came in. You're ejecting the contamination, clearing the passages. Got it. Engine side out. Makes perfect sense. Okay, weekly coolant level checks quarterly radiator cleaning from the correct direction. Mm -hmm. Let's touch on the last main problem area the source has highlighted, electrical and ignition systems. Wow. 
Problem six, these systems are getting more complex, right? They really are. You've got the traditional ignition side and the uh, increasingly sophisticated digital control side. On the ignition front, faulty glow plugs are a frequent issue. Glow plugs, they're essential for cold starts in a diesel, right? <laughs> Preheating the combustion chamber. Absolutely vital. If they fail, especially in colder weather, the engine might crank but just won't fire up. Then you have the control panel itself. The brains of the operation. Right. These can fail due to moisture getting in, damage from power surges on the utility side, or even just, you know, component failure or outdated software. And don't forget the wiring itself. Simple wires causing big problems. Oh, yeah. Vibration can work connections loose over time. Corrosion is always a threat. And rodents, they seem to love chewing on wire insulation. We saw a case study where a massive engine overhaul costing hundreds of thousands was ultimately traced back to a single wire chewed by a mouse. Unbelievable, a tiny wire. That brings up the ATS, the automatic transfer switch. Where does that fit in and how do we make sure it's reliable? The ATS is crucial. It's the device that senses when the main utility power fails. It then signals the generator to start, and once the generator is ready, it physically switches the building's electrical load from the failed utility grid over to the generator. So if the ATS fails, the generator could start up perfectly, run beautifully, but your building stays dark because the switch never transferred the load. Ouch! So testing the ATS is vital. How often? Monthly. Yeah. That monthly exercise we talked about. It should include a test of the APS function, simulate a power outage, make sure the generator starts, and make sure the switch transfers the load correctly, then transfers back when simulated power is restored. Okay. We've covered a lot of failure points. How do we wrap this all up into a coherent defense strategy? It comes down to rigorous, structured, preventive maintenance. Not waiting for things to break, yeah. but actively working to keep them from breaking. It's far more cost-effective in the long run. So let's recap that ideal schedule weekly. Weekly? Walk around, look, listen, check for leaks, any weird noises, obvious damage, mm -hmm. check your fluid levels, fuel, oil, coolant, check that battery voltage, just basic awareness. And monthly. Monthly is crucial. That's your 30 minute minimum exercise under load using a load bank. Okay. And testing the automatic transfer switch operation. Those two things are key. Annual. Annual is the big service. Full oil change, change all the filters, fuel, oil, air, flush and replace the coolant. Do a proper load test on the batteries, not just a voltage check. Inspect the whole electrical system, thoroughly connections, wiring, test the glow plugs, check alternator output, maybe even insulation resistance tests on the generator windings. It's comprehensive. Proactively replacing things before they fail. Based on time and condition, yes. Yeah. And critically, document everything. Ah, the logs. Why is keeping detailed records so important? Several reasons. One, warranty compliance. Many manufacturers require proof of maintenance. Two, it helps you track trends. Maybe fuel consumption is creeping up, mm -hmm. indicating an issue. Three, it helps with budgeting for future maintenance and replacements. And four, it just provides a history if problems do arise. What was done, when, by whom. Invaluable for troubleshooting. Okay, this has been incredibly detailed if we had to boil it down. The sources really converge on this. Generator reliability comes down to mastering four critical systems. Get these right, and you eliminate probably 85%, maybe more, of failure. And those are... One, Fuel delivery quality, cleanliness delivery. Yeah. Two, battery power starting energy, reliable charge. Three, cooling circulation, preventing overheating. And four, ignition components, including the controls like the ATS. Focus your preventative efforts there. Fuel, battery, cooling, ignition. Master those and you're in a much, much better place. Absolutely. It translates directly into peace of mind knowing that when the lights go out everywhere else, your generator is ready to be that guardian of continuity. That's the goal. And the cost of this structured maintenance, it really is minimal compared to the cost of downtime, emergency repairs, or the consequences of failure in critical applications. No comparison. Which leads to maybe a final thought for you to consider. You look at your own systems. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about this scheduled time-based maintenance, which is essential. But thinking ahead, given how high the stakes are, how might new technologies change the game? Things like advanced remote monitoring, using sensors to track subtle changes in vibration or fuel chemistry, or winding temperatures in real time. Could predictive maintenance, systems designed for early warning recognition, help close that gap even further? Detect problems brewing long before they cause a catastrophic failure. That's a fascinating question. Moving beyond just prevention towards actual prediction. Something definitely worth exploring. We hope this deep dive gives you the tools to keep that essential power flowing.